Hey, welcome everyone to Hatchworks First GenDD Labs Live. If you're curious what GenDD is, it's our generative driven development methodology. We're applying Gen AI to every aspect of the software development lifecycle to make things go faster, accelerate, speed to value, all that good stuff. But today we got something special for you. Our very own David Berrio, so he's a senior AI ML engineer at Hatchworks, is going to take us step by step on how to deploy an LLM locally and implement a RAG, which is a retrieval augmented genera generation uh, powered chatbot. And if you don't know what any of this stuff is, don't worry. I'm going to play the role of asking any and all dumb questions along the way. So David, be prepared. Uh, I, I, I'm here to learn as well. And please ask questions in the chat as we go. We'll probably field some uh, if it makes sense in the session. We'll also have Q&A at the end. So please drop those in as we go. Uh, but with that, I'm going to turn it over to David to set us up with the why behind this, the problem statement of why you would do something like this. But David, get us kicked off. Okay, Matt. Thank you so much. Okay, so I'm going to share my screen here. Um... Okay, Matt, are you able to see now? Yeah, we got it. Yep. Okay, great. Yeah, so thank you, Matt, for, for the introduction. Uh, yeah, uh, as you mentioned, we're going to be talking today about uh, a couple of interesting topics. So one of them is deploying LLMs on on local machines or on-premise uh, servers. And the other one is going to be implementing a, a chatbot uh, using the RAG architecture, which is, as you mentioned, retrieval augmented generation architecture. Um, and we are going to combine both things. So I'm going to, to demo the implementation of uh, a retrieval augmented a generation chatbot deployed on my local machine here. And we are going to see like step-by-step step how to build this, which kind of elements do we need to, to, to assemble a solution like this one. Uh, and yeah, so first, well, this is uh, the agenda. We are going to talk a bit about the problem statement, the main challenges that we might have when implementing these kind of solutions. Uh, then we are going to uh, do the demonstration uh, of the solution that we that we have. And we are going to have uh, also some time for Q&A uh, to solve like any questions that you may have or maybe bring up some discussions related to any of these topics. So yeah, let's get started. So, uh, well, as we mentioned, today's goal is to to present and to demo an end-to-end -end POC of how to implement a local rack powered chatbot using tools like Langchain, Streamlit, and well, others that we will uh, see down in the in, in the demo. Um, so one of the main things that that people might ask themselves is like, okay, why should we bother doing this? Like, I mean, we have a uh, chat GPT, we have like all these uh, flashy uh, models that are coming up every day and which we can interact uh, very easily through through different APIs or even assembled products like, like for example, the case of GPT, of chat GPT. Uh, so, uh, and yeah, there, there are definitely, uh, many things why this is important. So I would like to point a, a couple of them. So the first thing is that I think that 2024 is going to be a year when enterprises are going to start moving from POCs to, to production development. So they last year was all about testing a Gen AI, experimenting, playing around with it and see how it can help solving real business uh, problems. Uh, but I think this year is when we are going to start seeing uh, some of those prototypes, some of those experiments uh, turning into real products uh, that will be used by, by companies. And this, of course, implies that they are going to scale uh, in the amount of, of, of consumption that they do to, to this kind of, of, of models. And of course, if we... If we see, for example, the the pricing for ChatGPT, for GPT-4, and any of these API-based models, uh, they will uh, scale as you as you incre uh, increase the amount of requests that you that you do make to them. So uh, once you are operating at a very large scale, it's probably going to make sense to have your own model deployed on your own infrastructure or an infrastructure provided by a 
cloud provider like AWS or Azure, but that gives you like fixed price instead of having to to pay by by the demand that you have. So this might make a lot of sense this year now that uh, we are starting to move to to real deployments, uh, and also another critical aspect that I've seen. Uh, can make this very relevant is that uh, legal and infosec teams and not only those but many teams from different natures and that are developing different kind of products uh, don't like relying on api based models like gpt4 uh, or like uh, mistral large or, or or the recently released cloud models uh, because basically you are you are like uh, like providing lots of confidential information to third parties uh, that maybe you don't want to, or maybe you have to to be compliant with with some regulations, and you need to be very, um, like like very obsessive with the security of your data. I have seen like lots of scenarios like that, so that has been like a, you know like like an impediment for many companies to start ad adopting these kind of solutions because they don't want to rely on third party apis and they are always like okay what other options do i have if i if i want to have more privacy on my data yeah um, i was just chatting with uh we got a podcast built right podcast y'all go check it out but it was the chief uh, strategy officer at salesforce and she's now doing her own AI startup. And she, we were literally just talking about this. She's going through the process of deciding, okay, which, which uh, model am I going to use? And she's looking at both uh, from the open source ones. And it's the exact points you mentioned, right? It's the flexibility, the security, and then the pricing. Cause like, as you mentioned, once you make that decision to go say chat GPT four, not to pick on the um, pick on them, but it gets expensive, especially if it's like foundational yeah. for your uh, solution. Yeah, correct. Yeah, th that's definitely the scenario for many companies. And I was even reading this morning an article where where they did like a like in a study of the, of how confident is like the market of of the main AI providers. And it seems like like people is not so confident that they are doing things correctly with with privacy mm -hmm. and. and and with the data that the clients are providing to them. So yeah, I think this is definitely going to be critical this year. Uh, so yeah. also there are there are some opportunities here. And one of them is that open malls, I mean, open source malls are closing the gap. There are starting to be like very powerful open source malls that you can use uh, on your own deployments. And, and definitely are getting very close to what GPT-4 can do uh, and other state of the of the art models can do. So that that brings like lots of opportunities for these kind of solutions. And also, I think this is going to be the year of small language models uh, because definitely those small models can do better for specific tasks. There there has been like many recent releases that of of language models that are fine tuned to to do some specific tasks uh, with fewer amount of parameters uh, and of course open source uh, and they are doing better for some tasks than than huge models like gpt4 so i think this is also going to be very relevant because uh, for many business situations you don't need a model like it's a titan that can do anything sometimes you just want a model that is very good at doing a specific task so this is also a very uh, good opportunity for this kind of solutions to to shine so because you know uh, small language models are smaller are easier to run uh, on your own devices are cheaper so this will also bring lots of, of opportunities for this kind of solutions so we also have some challenges of course so as we mentioned uh, LLM models are hardware demanding so currently uh, basically the only way to to run a uh, LLMs on on real production environments with you know with a decent performance is by using GPUs and we are limited to Nvidia GPUs right now this is changing and I think there are going to be very interesting players in, in in the next few years for example if you look at what Grok is doing with their language processing units for inference and I've heard about a few others that will probably help democratizing this this hardware a monopoly that currently Nvidia has on 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 LLM inference 
Um, so yeah, but currently that's that's the reality. We still rely on NVIDIA GPUs and we will for, for a while. Um, so yeah, LLM models are hardware demanding. And of course, building a, a solution on premise will require more design decisions. You will need to, it's not just like, okay, I'm going to to use GPT-4 uh, or, or whatever or model. You need to you need to definitely take a, a deep uh, look at what kind of models do you have available and which one can benefit your 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 business better or the kind of application that you are developing better. Uh, and there are tons of options available. We might get uh, into more detail later when we are uh, taking a look at the demo and when we are seeing how all these uh, elements uh, tie together and 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 help us building like the whole solution. Uh, and of course, there's always going to be the question of, okay, how I'm going to serve this model, how I'm going to deploy it, which kind of tools I'm going to use, how I'm going to build like the user interface. You know, you, you are now in charge of everything, uh, of, of every piece of the, of the whole solution. You now need to think about it. Uh, so of course that's a challenge, but I definitely think it can be very beneficial to, to have a clear understanding on the of the main elements that you need to to know here, um, so yeah, so let's let's get uh, like into more detail. So we were talking a lot about retrieval augmented generation, uh, and I think many people have heard about it, but uh, probably many of you don't understand like completely how this works. So retrieval augmented generation is basically a, a it's like an architecture that's what that was developed to to enhance like uh, LLMs by using retrieval uh, techniques. So basically, this kind of of architecture is used when you want to to give like more accurate context to your models and uh, to be able to generate more accurate answers or more accurate responses depending on the use case that you are using your LLM for. Um, and yeah, so basically what we are doing here is that we are providing a knowledge base, which is uh, a set of, of documents, images, or whatever kind of information and documentation that you have and you want your model to learn. Uh, you are providing do that documentation. You are embedding that information. We are going to discuss more about this embedding later. Uh, and we are going to store that information in a vector database. So our model can interact with it and can use that information that is stored there to answer the the user questions. In this case, it's a chatbot. So I'm going to uh, be responding questions. Uh, so it's going to be used to, to answer those questions uh, more accurately without uh, as much hallucination as you will have like on regular chatbot. So this is kind of the architecture that we are using. So uh, let's let's describe like uh, each of the components. So first we have a user interface. What we are going to build today is a chatbot. Uh, so we have a user interface similar to what we have in ChatGPT. Uh, basically, the user prompts a question and the and the chatbot responds. So we have that interface here. That interface is going to be sending uh, the questions to a framework. In this case, the framework that we are going to be using is Langchain framework, which is a, a basically a Python framework that help us develop applications using LLMs. Then that uh, that that framework is going to query our vector database uh, based on the question that the user asked, and is going to look for the more relevant documents or sections of the documents uh, to to use as context to be able to answer the the user question as as accurate as possible. So once we have that, the framework is going to send that that question with the contest retrieved from the from the knowledge base to an inference engine that is going to uh, execute an LLM, which is a, a language model similar to GPT-4, uh, to, to Mistral Lurch, to, to, to the new cloud models, to Gemini, uh, and all of those models that we hear a lot about. So basically, we are going to request to, to that large language model that, that that language model is going to give us a response. 
the inference engine is going to provide that response again to the framework and we will we will be able to to show that in the in the user interface again so the the user has the response that that was waiting for uh, so this sounds like a lot of things and i don't expect like this is completely clear by now uh, so i think the best way to to get to understand this better is to actually jump into the code and start like seeing okay what is the user interface that we are using what is the framework what is this embedding model and yeah i think it will be clearer when once we get into the into the model so uh, yeah let's, let's, get there. let's jump into it yeah, and, and exactly. while you're pulling that up, it's, you know, you think of this rag model architecture, it's it's uh, a very general purpose is kind of like the chat GPT type of thing. Having the knowledge base in the rag model architecture really yep. allows it to be tailored for a specific thing, which is really cool. Exactly. Yeah. So this is where we want to get. This is the example of, of the chatbot that we are going to be uh, building today. So this this chatbot I name it like Hatchworks Sage SageMaker Wizard. As many of you might know, SageMaker is an AWS service to to build machine learning models. So basically, what we are going to be doing here is uh, providing a, a knowledge base of the documentation of of AWS SageMaker, so we can make our chatbot a a wizard. A, of, of this particular service. So we can ask anything related to SageMaker and it should be able to give accurate answers without hallucinations and based on the actual official documentation of, of the service itself. This can be whatever you want. I mean, for, for any, um, it really depends on, on your business, but if you have any specific documentation that you want to, uh, to use as the knowledge base for for your chatbot, there's no limitation on this. I mean, the only limit is creativity here. Uh, you can make your chatbot expert on any topic that you have the correct documentation um, to provide to it. Uh, so in this case, like an example, this, there. Yep. I was just going to say that back to the the person I was chatting with earlier. What they're building, something very similar, but they have employee resource documents, things related to legal, HR. And they're exactly. using this rag model architecture. So like another example um, of something you could do. So that's where you start thinking about, okay, the data you have proprietary within your own company, that's the type of stuff you could get into this. And this is a chatbot example, but really you could get into any workflow or thing you're doing within your business, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that, that's the, that's the idea. This is not only limited to chatbot. Here. That's the that's the demo that we have today, but this can be applied to to many uh, use cases definitely, um, and yeah, with any kind of documentation that that you might have. Um, okay, so let's see how we get here, uh, and so let's jump into the code. Basically, uh, well, this is the. This is the repo that I created for for building this project. So if you see, we have like a, a few uh, a few directories and a few uh, files here, and we are going to explain. And just for for one yep. second, uh, David, just for like folks that aren't technical, and you're like, oh man, we're going into code. Like, so this is Visual Studio Studio Code, and yep. really anybody can go and download this. But uh, maybe just provide a little bit of context of what you're in and if you're curious about it good literally go talk to chat gpt and it kind of walk you through how to how to set this up if you want to get in the weeds yeah yeah exactly so um yeah as you mentioned this is vs vs code studio um and yeah it's basically a, a development uh uh it's Ide, uh, an ID for for development software. It's it's very straightforward. You can get it very very easily. And we are going to be using Python for this demo. Uh, I don't really want like I mean you don't need to to know Python to to follow this explanation. That's why yeah. I want to to make like the parallel with with what we have here. I want to to identify like each of these items in our code so it's clear for for each, for everyone like how are these different items interacting. Yeah. Um, so yeah, basically here what we have is is all we need to build the the yeah. this, this demo. As you see, it's not a lot of things. Basically, we have a an environment a directory. This environment is like the, I mean, it contains like all the all the requirements and all the dependencies that Python will need to be able to run this uh, this this chatbot. So this is. 
This is built using the, the requirements TXT, which is basically like all the different libraries. Uh, this might look like a lot of things, but there are many typical uh, Python libraries here that uh, are used like for for, for many day-to-day uh, -day applications. So nothing nothing weird here. Uh, this is just like the environment that, that we need to execute the, the project. So uh, the next thing is the document directory. So this document directory contains all the documentation for AWS SageMaker that we were mentioning uh, before. So this, this directory is basically this knowledge base. Here we have all the documents that we are going to uh, to provide to our uh, application so the LLM model can answer based on, the, on that documentation. Now, and the way so you would do that today, you, you'd have to go Google, go find the document, go read the document to try to answer your question. But here you're putting everything into this knowledge base to where you could in that exactly. language query it. So that's the beauty of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why this is so powerful. I mean, this is not going to just retrieve a uh, whatever paragraph seems to be answering the question and just give it to you. No, it's going to understand what what's in there in that paragraph, and it's going to uh, to understand also your question and uh, answer based on that context, but like in a way that makes sense for us as humans. So that's the the beauty part of of natural language and. And that's why this retrieval augmented generation is so popular because it combines like the best of two worlds, uh, the best of uh, LLMs, uh, natural language processing, and the best of retrieval systems, which give accurate responses. So yeah, here, if you see, all we have is like a bunch of uh, AWS SageMaker documentation uh, in Markdown format. This can be like in any plain test format that you can provide. It doesn't have to be marked down, uh, but yeah. So basically, this this folder, this directory contains like everything related to knowledge base. Uh, okay, so now the first thing that we're going to do is like we want uh, this knowledge base to be introduced into a vector database, so uh, so our model can understand uh, that information because you know basically LLM models don't understand vectors and numbers; they are basically mathematical entity. So we want to transform all those documents into something that our model can actually understand. So this is going to be the first step. And it's what I have here in this learn, uh, learning con context uh, notebook. This is just a Python notebook, which is an interactive way to interact with Python and and kind of see a step by step what, what we're doing. Um, so if you see, we're importing some dependencies here and the most important ones is Langchain and um, P Epsilon. So uh, Langchain, as I mentioned before, is going to be the framework that we will be using. Langchain is just a Python package that provides uh, many different tools to be able to build applications based on large language models and other kind of uh, AI models as well. Uh, so it will provide us a uh, a lot of tools that will come handy for, for development of, of this demo. Um, PyEpsila is going to be the, the vector database that we are going to use. Basically, is where we are going to store all that knowledge base, but in a vector uh, format, like in a way that our model can understand. So the one that we selected for this demo uh, is is a vector database called Epsila, and we need to import PyEpsila, which is basically a, a, the Python package to be able to interact with, with that vector database, where we are going to store everything that is in our knowledge base. So the last part that we need to be able to store our knowledge base into a vector database is the embedding model. So as we mentioned before, we need our documents to be transformed into a format that a, our model can understand. So it needs to be stored as vectors. And for doing that, we are going to use what we call an embedding model. This is also a, a, a machine learning model. It's a, a deep learning model, a neural network that will transform a chunk of text into a vector that our model can better understand. So that, that embedding model that we are going to use is is defined on this line. We are going to use this all mini LM L6 V2 uh, embedding model. This is a very typical model for this kind of tasks. It would transform a, 
your your piece of text into a 384 dimensional vector for to be stored in your in your vector database. Uh, so this is basically what we are doing on these first lines. We are defining like okay, we are we are pointing to our knowledge base location, um, and we are we are using this this uh, embedding model to embed all those uh, documents into into our vector database. But we we are not going to embed the documents like one document is going to be one vector. We are not going to do it like that. For this example, we are going to 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 chunk them into yeah to split them into smaller chunks. Each of these chunks is going to be a uh, one thousand characters a uh, long. Uh, so basically, what we are going to do is that we are going to split each of the documents here into chunks of one thousand uh, characters, uh, and then those chunks. Are what we are going to transform into vectors on our on our vector database. So basically, that is what we are doing on these first lines. We are connecting to our vector database, which is a, is also currently deployed locally in a Docker container. So we are connecting to that vector database, and we are storing those chunks it transform into into vectors. Uh, so our our model can interact with them and can uh, understand, OK, this chunk of text is going to be helpful to answer this particular question from the user. So this is basically the logic behind this. And uh, and it's everything that we are doing here, this is just like the process of transforming each of the chunks into, into a vector. And once we get this part done, we'll have our vector database uh, completely uh, filled with the documentation that we want our model to use. So we have like this part in the bottom completely covered. We got our knowledge base, uh, split it into uh, different chunks, embedded each of those chunks into a vector and stored those vectors into a vector database. So our model can uh, read them later. So now we are going to work on the part on the top. Uh, Basically, we want to start building the user interface where uh, the user is going to prompt a question. That question is going to be processed by the framework. That that question will need to be embedded also using the same model that we used before. Like we need to transform that question into a vector to be able to find from the knowledge base, which was like the the section of the knowledge base that uh, that can better help us uh, answer that question. Uh, so let's take a look at that. So basically, that's here in our app, uh, that pi file. And for this, as we mentioned at the beginning, we are going to use a a, a framework which is called Streamlit. It's a very easy to use framework for developing uh, user interfaces. Uh, mostly, this is mostly uh, for for AI and ML applications. I mean, you can do a uh, uh, front ends and user interfaces for for whatever you want, but the I mean the simplicity of this and and the design of of, of this package of this streamlit package is really aimed for for building a uh, AI applications. And so it and streamlit really is kind of the... for like the it's almost like the the front end side of it for the, the chat making that super easy versus having to build it from like exactly. the ground up. It, it exists. But I did get one question that was kind of interesting. Okay. Uh, and let me know if you already go in here in a minute. But Eric, Eric was asking, <clears throat> can we retrieve the data directly from the data source? Why do we need to convert it to a vector database? And I know you okay. had that visual kind of showing that. It may be an interesting thing yeah. to get into without yeah. going too deep into like, you know, the the mathematical and calculus reasons behind it. But Yeah, no, that, that's a good one. And I think... Uh... The answer is that okay, we need to convert it into a vector because there's, I mean, it there's no when we when we, when we embed a chunk of text, what we are capturing in that vector is like the context and the and like the semantic relevance of that piece of text. So even if the user uh, prompt a question that doesn't use like the same exact words as you have in your in your knowledge base, uh, 
we will be able to, to know that they are talking about the same concepts and we will be able to match them. Different, if we, if we try to retrieve directly from the text, we will need to use like probably sentence, similarity, algorithms, uh, which are not going to capture like the essence of the context itself, but it's going to be more like uh, how the string patterns or the text patterns uh, match each other. So that's why uh, embedding a text is very powerful because we are capturing like the essence of the text itself we are capturing like the context and the idea is the ideas behind the text instead of just the words that they are using to to build that text so that's why uh, it's more powerful to to use embeddings and compare a uh, and try to match uh, with with embedded uh, vectors that than than using the just the text itself. And, and the, you can almost visualize like a map where it's like putting the different things. Yeah, correct. Uh, I, I think on, I might have visual, an example right? here. Yeah, let me yeah, see. Yeah, show that. I know you've shown it before if you can get to it. And yeah, it, it this... may make sense to talk through GPT for all just for reference, but correct. it's yeah, a this, neat this... example. Exactly, yeah. This is a good one. So here, this is a, a simple representation of, a, of an embedding in two dimensions. I mentioned that the embedding that we are using is I mean, it has like 384 dimensions, so it's impossible to visualize, but here it's easier to, to do it because basically uh, this, this is this is like a, a map of uh, of the embeddings for, um, for, for a data set of questions or conversations that they, that they have on GPT-4All. Uh, we're going to talk a bit more about GPT-4All later, but it's basically a repository of LLM uh, open source models and data sets. So this is a data set of question and answers uh, of different topics. And each of these dots here is, is a vector. And if you click on it, you will see it's just like a, a conversation about a topic, about a specific topic. So this point is basically an embedding in two dimensional space of this conversation that we have here. Uh, and if you see the beauty of this is that they kind of group by topics. So we have like some, uh, you know, like some interesting topics here, like for example, HTML, uh, sentiment analysis, uh, Angular JS, and and if we get closer and select any of these points here, they are most likely be talking about that general topic that we have here. So this way, we can like group a, a chunks of text by their context and the topic that they are talking about instead of just the words. So that's why it's so beautiful to do this, and also. Uh, Imagine we have a, you know, we have this this vector database, and we receive a question. Let's say that question uh, from the user is related to API keys. So once we embed that question, that question is very likely to be uh, to be also mapped uh, here, closer to this to this section of the of the space. So uh, it will be as easy as calculate like the closer point to that question to to retrieve like the 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 piece or the chunk of text that is closer in in context and significance to the question that the user prompted so that's why it makes a lot of sense to use these these vector databases to 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 store embedded uh, chunks of text instead of of just the the plain text yeah i appreciate that tangent but it's really cool if anybody wants to go deep on that like it gets really yeah. interesting like how this stuff actually works and that's why we're seeing this like crazy Exactly. revolution right now yeah i think uh, this, is the foundation. this is the yeah. foundation of, of all of this and it can be even used for images so you can embed images and you will see that they will grow up by for example the kind of objects that they have and their context mm -hmm. it, it's very cool topic and i think this is like the main development that has enabled all this uh, ai revolution of the last years um, okay so uh, well now that we have a uh, now we are we are going to focus on building our our uh, user interface and interact with the model, like all this upper side of the of the architecture that we have here. So as as we mentioned, we are going to be using a, a Streamlit. A, a Streamlit is a very lightweight a, and easy to use framework, so a, it's very convenient for this kind of applications. A, and if you see, we are going to use the same exact embedding model that we used before because. If we see again, we need to connect the embedding again because we are going to embed each of the user questions. So we need to load that model again. 
we we need to connect to to our knowledge base uh, to our database our vector db which in this case is epsilon again so we are able to retrieve the context that we want to use and now extremely it is very very straightforward so basically i just uh, I'm just building like some headers here and just importing like the Hatchworks image. Uh, I'm giving a title to the to the LLM, a SageMaker wizard, and I'm give, giving a predefined message to, to receive you. So uh, basically this message is going to be, I'm here to answer any question you might have related to AWS SageMaker. Uh, and yeah, basically we, we want to have a fixture of the chat history. So each time we interact with it, we can see like the previous messages. Um, and now we are going to uh, to create like a placeholder for the user to, to prompt the question. Um, so yeah, basically here we are we are generating, we are we are retrieving the question that the user prompt uh, through the interface. And You'll see this is very straightforward because basically here we are receiving the question as this question variable. And now what we are going to do is that we are going to use that question to look for the chunks of text that are closer. Remember that we re transformed everything into vectors and remember the what, what we were seeing before uh, that we basically can calculate distances between those vectors. We want to determine like the three closer documents to to that question or the three closer chunks of text to that question. So we can use those three chunks of text as context to be able to answer the question. Uh, so yeah, basically this is what we are doing here and we are getting what we call the context. So now with the question, the user prompt and the context that we received, we are able to create like our real prompt. So imagine we are writing a prompt to, to chat GPT, the real prompt that we are going to send to, to our model is not only what the user asked, but it's going to be like this whole template that we have here. So the first thing is like a general instruction. So answer the question based on the given context and try to understand the context and rephrase them. Um, please don't make up things or say things that not mentioned in the contest and provide short and clear answers. Uh, and, and for then, anybody that like that point right there, if if you've created a custom GPT or interacted with like chat oh, yeah. GPT, that's almost kind of like your custom instructions. So just exactly. to try to like equate uh, what Correct. that is. So that's how, how David's representing that in the code yep. here. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So yeah, that, that's exactly what it is. So here, then after, after that general instruction, we are going to provide the context, which is the context that we retrieved from the from the text. Here, the context is going to be provided in natural language again, uh, not in the vector, of course, because we are providing a natural language uh, prompt here. And then we are going to append the question that the user actually uh, generated. So if you see, the prompt is going to have three different components, not just the question that the user uh, asked and that's uh, how uh, how this uh, retrieval augmented generation works basically uh, we we combine all the, the retrieved context uh, general instruction and the question to be able to uh, to answer more accurately to the to the user and then we just so we got the, a, the answer we got a quick question uh, yes? from the audience so they're saying what is the context in this example so it, I'll try to say it in layman's terms and David, you correct me where I'm wrong, but the okay. question is the question that the user interacting with the chat bot, bot is posing. The context okay. is the entire knowledge base, which in this example are all of the AWS documents you'd find on the internet. So it's using that context, which could be anything, you know, it could be employee resource documents or whatever, but that's the context. And it uses the custom instructions to help guide it on how to answer it. Is that, is that accurate? Yeah, almost, almost completely accurate, but we are not using the whole context. We are using the chunk of context that we retrieved that we, that our retrieval step defined was relevant for answering this because mm. using the whole context might kill uh, your, your GPU VRAM. I, I mean, it will be very, very heavy for, for a machine to process the whole context if it's very long. So that's why we are retrieving like the, like the, in this case, the three closer chunks of text that might help answering that question. And those chunks of text is what we are appending here. So each of these chunks of text for, the, for this example, are each of those uh, is 1000 characters. So this context is going to be a 3000 character context uh, 
retrieved out of the whole uh, documentation or knowledge base that we had. Cool. So yeah, basically uh, that's that's it. Uh, so yeah, now with, with this template, we can create our complete prompt. And this is the prompt that we are going to send to our model. So here comes the next play, the next part, and is this this additional directory that we have here, which is the models directory. So here is where we are storing the heart of our solution, which are the, the LLM models. Uh, so in this case, here I have two models stored on this directory. One of them is Gemma 2 billion parameters uh, and Mistral 7 billion fine-tuned on OpenOrca uh, database. So basically those two are two uh, different LLM models. And this is also very interesting. There are many repositories that we can use to get these models already trained. We don't need to train those models by ourselves. So let's take a look at a, at a couple of them. So one is Hugging Face. This is a very popular uh, model repository. So if you see here, we have different types of models. We have multi-model models. We have computer vision, natural language, audio models. You have everything here. This is a very, very rich uh, repository for open source models. And if you see here, we have, for example, uh, Gemma 7 billion from Google. Uh, we have a Whisper Large, which is basically a audio to text model. Um, we, has, we have Mixtral uh, 8, 8 by 7 billion, which is basically a, a mixture of experts by, by Mistral. Uh, yeah, and if you see, we have a bunch of models here that we can use for our projects and that we can download completely free. Uh, this is one good repository. The other one is the one that we were seeing before, GPT for All. Basically here, we also have a bunch of models that are selected uh, and and rated uh, for different kind of, of, of activities or, or different kind of tasks. So the one that we are going to be using on this demo is this one here, Missile 7 billion uh, Q4. Q4 is basically the quantization. We, the quantization is like a compression. We're not going to get into a lot of details here uh, about what quantization is, but basically uh, it helps make the model, uh, the model more lightweight so we can use it uh, in local environments like this. Uh, and GGUF is the, the extension of this particular model. It is also related, the kind of extension that you have also has a relation with the kind of quantization that you have. But I mean, we're not going to get into very much detail here, but they are closely related. So- And if you're if, on the business side here, like the, um, yeah. this is where the alternative to a chat GPT for, th these are all the open source options. So you saw all Correct. these different things you could do in Hugging Face, different types of models for different types of exactly. problems. So like if you want to sound smart with your engineering team, start bringing this stuff up, they'll-, they'll uh, It'll start perking up and um, yeah, you'll get into a lot of interesting conversation. You can really start to tailor your solution once you yeah. start using a lot of these open source things. Exactly. And that's, I think the, the that word you use, tailoring your solution, it's, it's a key point yeah. because yeah, basically each of these models has its own advantages, disadvantages. So you, that's why you need to, to carefully select the one that suits better your, your, your requirements that very suits also your infrastructure. Uh, and yeah, there are many variables to keep in mind there. This GGUF, it's a very general uh, format that you can use in mostly any scenario. Uh, okay, so this is the one that they're going to be using for this demo. And we have it here, Mistral 7 billion open Arca Q4 and GGUF format. Uh, so yeah, basically on this step here, what we are doing is using a, um, Langchain, which is our framework, let's go back to 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 our architecture to to call our inference engine. We don't want to get also into a lot of detail there, but the one that we are going to be using is the uh, Llama CPP, which is a very popular engine, and it is able to to work with GGUF models. Also, the engine that you use will also uh, work for different kind of of quant quantization techniques and different formats of the models. So Llama CPP is a very uh, common one that works very well with GGUF and allow you to work both on CPU or on GPU. So it gives you the, the possibility to, to do inferences uh, of the model using both GPU or, or CPU. So it's a very flexible one. 
and is the one that they are going to be using here. So basically we are calling a, a llama CPP object a, using that using that model here, a, which is the Misfile 7 billion. A, and yeah, that's almost all of it. A, here we are, we are going to be using a, a local GPU that I have on my PC. So I'm going to import all the layers of the model into the GPU. So I'm going to use uh, this uh, minus one here. If we use zero, for example, I won't import any layer to the GPU. So it's going to be using the CPU completely, but that's not going to be the case. I'm going to be using minus one. Uh, and yeah, these are the parameters for the window length that we want the model to understand and the and the batch that we want to, to use the batch of tokens that we want to, to be pro processing at each time uh, inside our model. So these are uh, more technical, uh, like hyperparameters of the, of the inference engine. Uh, but yeah, basically what we are doing here is that we are importing our model using a Lang chain our and our inference engine into Python to be able to make inferences on it. Um, so yeah, that's almost uh, all of it. Now that we have the model imported, we we basically uh, append the well, we we run it to execute the model on the prompt. And then remember the prompt the prompt is basically this this template. We we send that template to the model, execute the model, and it will of course generate an answer. Throw that answer back to the inference engine, and the inference engine is going to throw that answer to a framework, which in this case is Langchain and Python, and we'll be able then to to display it uh, into into streamlit into our streamlit interface which is basically this last piece of code here and um, so yeah as you see very little uh, lines of code this has room for some improvements uh, but i mean this has like everything uh, that a general chatbot might need and if you see it's less than 100 lines of code uh, using langchain and streamlit so very very handy for for creating your your own uh, implementations of this and start experimenting, uh, and yeah, now let's let's go to the result. Um, let's go here. So yeah, this is basically the application running. I already asked some questions before. Um, so if you see, this is what I was talking about. We we this is the header that we created, the icon that we wanted to use, and here we have the fix the fixture of the chat. So we don't lose track of all the questions that we have been asking. And, and let's, let's task anything like, for example, um, how can I create a SageMaker container? Okay, let's send that question and let's get back here. I want you to see, so here basically it is loading the, the inference engine. It's offloading all the layers of the model to the to the GPU. Basically, this this Mistral seven billion model has thirty three layers. Remember, this all these models are deep neural networks, so they have a huge amount of layers. In this case, thirty three layers, and we are migrating those layers to the GPU. And then, uh, once that's loaded, uh, well, it will generate the the response. We will, we should have the response already here. Uh, yep. So basically, this is the SageMaker training toolkit and SageMaker inference toolkit repositories on GitHub. Uh, yeah, it basically gives you like the two instructions that you need to follow to be able to create a SageMaker container. Um, yeah, also we have here like the inference time here. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm executing on a local GPU. Uh, so it's running at, it's evaluating the prompt at at a speed of almost 200 tokens per second, and it's making inferences at 23 tokens per second. Uh, and for example, the response took like a bit more than seven, six seconds to 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 be able to get like the whole response. Um, and we had a question come in. I think yes, you and Carlo sure. answered some of it in the comments. We would love okay. for you to elaborate on it for folks who may not be watching the comments. Like using this on your local machine is a great way to kind of test proof of concept. But the question came up, if I don't have a GPU on my machine, which, you know, most of us probably don't, can you yeah. use a, a VM, a virtual machine to get compute needed in this framework? And right. You could use like AWS and um, Azure and things like that have uh, GP, GPUs you can essentially use similar to like the cloud, like we do with any other solution, but maybe go a bit deeper yep. there. 
Yeah, correct. Uh, yeah, I think that's, that's an accurate answer. So we have a GPU powered uh, virtual machines uh, on almost every uh, cloud provider, uh, like for example, in AWS or, or Azure, and we have like the top tier GPUs there available for us, like H100, uh, GH100 also. So we have a uh, we have that option also once we test like, for example, a, a proof of concept in our local machine, uh, we can then migrate this without doing lots of changes uh, into a more production enabled environment like a virtual machine on, on a cloud provider. Uh, and yes, and you will need to, to do many changes at all. Uh, probably, you know, there, there's some play there that you can do with the inference engine that you are using with the quantization because probably if you are testing in in local, you are using very lightweight models that are very hard quantized and very hard compressed, but uh, probably on your cloud environment, you don't need that and you can use a more powerful model. So you are free to do that. That's why this is so modular also. I think this is important because it's a modular solution where you have like each of the, each of the boxes is like completely independent of the other. Uh, so you can, if you need to change one box, you can do it and, and it will, I mean, it won't affect, but it shouldn't affect a lot of the of the other components. So that's why building this kind of modular solutions, it's also a good idea. And yeah, also because these models are evolving every day. So you might, might want to keep up to date. So you don't want an infrastructure that will require you to completely restructure everything once a new model is released. If you see here, adding a new model is just dropping that model into this folder and probably changing this path here. I could even, yeah, now that I think about it, I could even create here in the, in our, yeah, in our user interface, I could create a drop down menu with the different models that I have available there. And that should work also, that you can select the mold that you want to use. So it's very modular, very, very easy to, to, to modify different components of it. But yeah, so uh, we have powerful machines and cloud that we can use. Uh, even it's it's curious, but for example, this inference engine, Lama CPP works very well on Apple Silicon. I was able to do some tests on, on those. And if you have enough RAM on your machine, uh, you should be able to do some experiments local on your, on your, on your Apple Silicon. Uh, laptop or desktop and and you should get a good performance using this llama cpp inference engine and gguf models we got some uh questions coming in anything yep. else you want to hit on before we move to q a no i, I uh, think we can go to questions cool. that's that's perfectly fine yeah all right in one that came up uh, earlier apologies it may have been jd or peter um but they're talking about you got jim and i having this huge like million token context window yeah. Like, does that, like, how does that change things from your perspective from leveraging a RAG uh, model architecture versus like you think of context windows continuing to grow and grow? Does that shift things potentially down the road in terms of approach? Yeah, that's a, that's a very great question. Um, and yeah, unfortunately, we don't have like lots of detail on what's going on behind, behind Gemini, a huge uh, window. But I mean, chances are they are not loading that uh, huge window into the model VRAM, but probably they are uh, using some kind of, of logic or algorithm similar to what we were doing to, to, to like identify the parts in that huge context window that provide you the more relevant information to be able to answer the question. Because, you know, it's uh, if, if it was done like in the traditional way of, Feeding the model with that amount of context that will kill like almost any GPU will need like a huge infrastructure to be able to run it. So uh, my guess is they are using behind the hood a uh, kind of logic that is similar to this to be able to 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 support that uh, context uh, windows that are that big. Uh, but yeah, that's a very interesting answer because we'll see uh, how this evolves. Uh, of course, one of the advantages here is that we don't have a limitation because the retrieval side of it is giving us like, uh, yeah, a, a window uh, as big enough as you as you require because you are basically like filtrating and selecting the right parts of the context that you want. And I think my guess is that these kind of models are doing something similar, but uh, like but built in. 
directly out of the box. Cool. And we got a few more questions. And okay. um, cool. It, it, David, are you able to go a little past the hour if folks want to stick around? And Yeah, I can uh, stay for some them. minutes. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. So we got one from Peter. And it may be easier if you just open the chat as well, David. But he mentions a few questions around the vector database. Okay. Does it scale well from a retrieval perspective? We're thinking of thousands of uh, KB articles as opposed to 100,000 of articles. But do we need to consider retrieval speed? And the second point is we're thinking about a qualifying question. So we can split the data. Uh, for example, are you interested in HR, finance, operations, et cetera? He's asking, is that overkill? Uh, it, um, and then he goes on to say, do we need to validate the results as they will get closer and closer as you load more data? So do you need to put some form of validation in place, iterate to validate the answer? So a couple of different questions there that um, that are coming up that are pretty interesting. Yeah, so yeah, for, for the first part, uh, well, I, I think the question was more related to how this will scale if you have uh, even millions of documents in your knowledge yeah. base. Uh, and yeah, that's also one of the advantages of of using vector databases. So let's let's jump into this this GPT for all visualization. It's I think it's very helpful. I mean, this this really using a vector database really simplifies the process because if you have a question and you have a huge uh, amount of documents, no matter how many they are, you just need to 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 get into your I mean, to, to map your question to this same vector space and find the closest document, which is a very, very simple operation. Mathematically speaking, is a very simple operation to calculate the distance between between two dots. So you can have like a, a small neighbor, try to locate in that small neighbor, which are the the points or, or the other, the document chunks that you have that that are related to, to your question. If you don't have any, you might, uh, want to make your window bigger and try to search in that window if there are some documents. Uh, and yeah, it's like a, it ba it basically transforms into a k nearest neighborhood uh, problem, uh, which is very optimal uh, computationally. So this this is this is a very optimal solution from that perspective compared to to comparing the text right away because uh, yeah, basically this this turns into a closest point finding a problem which is is there a limit where it like kind of craps out though like if you're going from thousands of documents to hundreds of thousands or do you even is there a situation where you may split it up into different um you know instances of kind of what you just built well it depends uh not from a computational i mean not, for, not from a retrieval perspective in the terms of of how computational demanding it is, but if you want the retrieval to be more accurate, probably maybe you want to yeah to split your documents into different mm -hmm. topics, and then you can like initially do a retrieval of the topics and try to know okay this question is related to this particular topic, and then get into that a uh, data set or knowledge base related to that topic and do that process again to select like the chunks that are closer to it. And maybe that way you have more control on how it is looking for, for different kinds of information. Uh, and it might give you more accurate uh, uh, results. Also, uh, the, the approach that we are using to split the documents on this demo is like a naive approach. It's, we are splitting the documents by 1000 characters and we don't care like if the idea is complete or not in that thousand characters. There are more sophisticated approaches where you can like detect uh, paragraphs, you can detect like titles, subtitles inside your document and try to split uh, your document according to those instead of just randomly selecting uh, chunks of 1000 characters. So that's, that's, also yeah. a, that's also a good idea. There's a lot of investigation and research going on in, the, in that retrieval part as well. And it's also a very yeah. hot topic right now. And you will see there are lots of new approaches coming every day. That's cool. Yeah, Peter's mentioning they're thinking of grouping the chunks into like neighborhoods. So kind of a neat analogy there. Um, yeah. Rennie asked, uh, have you worked on a solution where besides the answers, you start keeping some, uh, besides the answers, you start keeping some of the data for analytics. For instance, what are the most common asked questions? This is something I've heard people 
brought up on GPTs that currently are not tracked, to my understanding, this feature is great for an FAQ bot, for instance. Uh, yeah, that, that's an interesting one. So uh, I have not worked directly on that, but I I could have like a few ideas. So yeah, it definitely, if you can store the questions and also have like a vector database for, for the questions that users have asked, then you can also uh, inside that vector database of, of questions, you can also make a, probably clusters for the questions, like, like the color groups that we have here. You can probably uh, generate clusters and try to extract the more relevant ideas of each of those clusters uh, of questions. And then, uh, you know, this is like kind of a non-supervised approach uh, for do some data analytics on the questions that users do. But I think it's a great idea also to to transform those questions into a, into a vector database to be able to try to understand like different clusters, different subsets that may come up inside, try to understand what each of each of those subsets are are talking about, similar to what we have here. Like we can then label each of those clusters based on the topic that they are talking about. And we can know like, okay, they, there are many questions in this particular cluster. So that seems that there are many questions related to X topic. Uh, yeah, very similar to the visualization that we have here. And there's an interesting discussion going on here too, uh, where they talk about where they think reinforcement learning will help, which is why I thought we would need to learn about fine tuning, but the vector database is a starting point and folks yep. are kind of going on to talk about the complement of fine tuning with feedback and then the RAG approach to improve, improve efficiency. And I keep going back to this chat I just had on the podcast with the strategy officer at Salesforce doing her own startup. And what was really interesting she was uh, using the tool in kind of a Wizard of Oz way where they had people coming in and chatting with the, the AI. The AI would provide a response, but they had a human on the other end actually carrying on the conversation. And okay. they used that for reinforcement learning for the tool, which was yeah. interesting to make the AI more curious. And then they also yes. were doing something really cool where they had uh, effectively like personas of different types of people that would use the tool and they had, which was like an AI bot, they had that talking to this, the AI solution. So the AIs were talking to each other. And that again was used as reinforcement learning to improve the solution. So really cool. Like, I don't know if you have any thoughts on like the reinforcement learning side of it, but that's another uh, really interesting way to kind of yeah. fine tune what you're building. Definitely. Yeah, that's, th this is a very, yeah. Uh like recurrent uh, discussion uh, on on all these LLM uh, environments. So how RAG compares to, to fine tuning? When should I use one, in, one instead of the other? So I would say the advantage of, of RAG is that uh, you can modify, I mean, it's more modular. You can modify your knowledge base release. I mean, I could just, uh, if I wanted, I could just delete all this AWS documentation here and add, I don't know, cooking recipes to this folder and now the model will know how to answer uh, questions related to cooking. For fine tuning, on the other hand, you will have to modify the model weights, which is like the model parameters themselves. So it's not that, uh, I mean, it's not that modular. You are you are affecting the model itself when you are fine tuning. So uh, of course it has its advantages because you are packaging the whole thing into a single model. If you want a model to be very expert on egg, uh, on cooking recipes by, fun, by fine tuning, you can fine tune that with a corpus of text that talk about cooking recipes. And then your output will be a, a model like the ones we have here that is very good at that without the need of, of any retrieval augmented uh, generation uh, architecture. But of course it's going to be less bolder. If you want it to be expert on, on AWS SageMaker now, you will have to retrain it again, refine tune it again using that documentation, which is sometimes a very intensive process uh, and create a new model. So the, there are some pros and cons here, um, but yeah, that's definitely a very interesting discussion I'm going there. Cool. So I think we're probably at a good stopping point. And uh, if anybody has any other questions, reach out to us. I think the the one thing to note, uh, if, if like this just looks too complicated or complex, like come talk to us at Hatchworks. We, this is what we do. We build custom solutions, especially in the... Uh, AI 
space. And we actually have a uh, solutions, uh, solution acceleration workshop where we'll go and proof of concept something for you in like anywhere from two to eight weeks based on the scope. But the, the key things like getting to the business problem, what you're looking to achieve, and then we get to POC. So reach out if anybody has any questions, wants to learn more, just wants to chat a bit more on an idea. I know, you know, we love ideating on some of these solutions. So don't hesitate to reach out. And if there's no other questions, I think we're probably at a good stopping point, but thanks everybody for joining. And thanks, David. Uh, awesome. I walked through, we had this recorded, so we'll put it out in case anybody wants to watch it again, share with others in your company uh, and get some good feedback coming in. Super useful. Thank you very much. So yeah, really appreciate it, David. Awesome walk through. Okay. Thank you, Matt. And thanks everyone for, for joining. Great. Thanks everybody. Have a good rest of your Thursday. Okay. Bye.